this week on MLS Insider. My first goal was beautiful for me. This is a good first uh, impression. There's times on the field when, when he makes a pass that, that I haven't seen uh, until he makes it. People try to say, well, did you try to create a European atmosphere? I mean, we tried to create an American atmosphere that was just rabid. The United States are in a kind of dreamland here. We were looking for a number 10, a playmaker, a creator. Um, we knew we needed that dimension in this team to play the way we wanted to play, and uh, Diego Valero seemed to be the perfect fit. Guillermo Barros Esquiloto, he was my coach in Lanús. He played here and uh, he told me about USA, about the MLS and uh, he always speak very, very, very good about the league. Yo lo aconsejé, yo le hablé, él tenía esa oferta, a vivir a Estados Unidos, a, a jugar en la MLS. Eh, seguramente fue un empujón lo que le di yo, porque el recuerdo que tengo yo de, de la liga y de la vida en Estados Unidos es excelente. Para mí ha sido maravilloso haber jugado ahí. He told me that the league it's very, very good, very competitive, very physical, good technical. Uh, and in Argentina, it's, it's, it's a little bit dangerous because the people is, is crazy with the soccer, no? La función que cumple el fútbol en la Argentina creo que es muy amplia. Prácticamente convive con eso en el día a día, en el trabajo, en el lugar donde está. Así que tiene una importancia mucho mayor a la que realmente debiera tener, sin duda. There's no sugarcoating some of the things that, that happen in a, in a league like the Argentinian one, um, with the fans and families not feeling safe. The violence is, uh, yes, now it's worse than 10 years ago. And the pressure is too much, you know, it's just a, a sport. And he told me that here is perfect for, for that. Well, I think uh, Diego's a family guy, and um, you know he grew up in Argentina, and, and obviously it's a great country. But he felt it would be a um, a better quality of life here in this country. My wife and me wants to be here, and now we we know the city and really we are very, very happy. It's very athletic league. There's a lot of direct play. It's not an easy league for an overseas player to transition to. The South American players, they have a different form to play, more quiet into the field, and the U.S. players are very good, very, very physical. Diego, he's taken some big hits from guys um, that think they'll disrupt his play, and, and he hasn't skipped a beat. The first few games, the other teams were to be physical with me, and that is no problem about that. Just, just play. Creo que se destaca el jugador argentino en Estados Unidos porque conoce el paño de lo que hace, el fútbol, el, el ganar. In that first game against New York, we're down a goal. Ball is kind of bouncing around the box and uh, kind of pulls something out of a hat and finishes a beautiful goal for us and we tie the game up. 
My first goal was beautiful for me because uh, I tried to show the people that I want to play in Poland and this is a good first uh, impression. The first goal he scored against New York to be able to, to pull that off was, it's a special play um, and there's not many players around the world who can make that. He's one of the nicest guys, honestly, I've ever coached and, and that's made a huge impact um, in our locker room and with our club. Uh, Diego is, first of all, he's a very humble guy and uh, down to earth, quiet. And I must say it's a pleasure getting to know him as a person, but also as a football player, he's a tremendous footballer. Well, he's a very technical, skillful player. You know, we needed a kind of a straw that stirs the drink. A guy that's gonna be the creator, that's gonna have the ball a lot and dictate what we're doing in the attack. He's a special player. There's times on the field when, when he makes a pass that, that I haven't seen uh, until he makes it. The stuff that goes through his brain and, you know, seeing things and being able to execute. He makes our midfield tick. I think Diego Valeri has those things that can be marked history in a team. I think he has quality, he has talent. If they are accompanied with a good character, he can mark a lot of difference in the league. He's a home run, Diego Valeri. We wouldn't be able to play the way we're playing without him. But beyond that, he's impacted our culture because he stands for all the right things. In Argentina, they didn't didn't go to to the stadium. They had to, to see the, the match at home. And now they going to the stadium with me, normal. You know, uh, I love this. I love this. This is this is my place. Coming up on MLS Insider. We're going in the secret way. Welcome to the greatest supporter section in all of the MLS. I always say this, we don't have a fan base anymore. We have a cult following. People tried to say, well, did you try to create a European atmosphere? And the answer is no. I mean, we tried to create an American atmosphere that was just rabid. But those first couple years, the Wiz played at Arrowhead Stadium, which at the time sat about 79,000. And on a good night, you know, the Wizards would draw, you know, probably around 12,000 fans on a, on a really, really good night. Marked by Goldthwait, crossing for Johnson, one near Kansas City. You know, it felt like we had a long way to go. We went from the stadium Arrowhead to a less fortunate situation, playing at a, a minor league baseball stadium for three years. It's tough because we were playing our games at Community America Ballpark, which is a minor league baseball stadium that holds 14,000 people. It was tough when you, you know, getting ready to go play a game and thinking we're gonna go play at a, at, a, at a baseball stadium and don't know how many people are showing up to the game. Everyone had a nice time, but no one was mad if we lost. You know, they'd come, you know, maybe have a, a cotton candy and a foam finger and go home and, and not think about it much. Um, so we had changed that culture around, certainly. Fast forwarding to 2010, it was it was a, what we called the summer of soccer in Kansas City. The Man U game was, there was a lot of buzz leading up to it. We had like 63,000 for that game. And for us as players, most of us had never played in front of 60,000 people before. So we, we step out and it's a, it's a different world. The whole place was seriously full of red jerseys and everything like that. People knew more about Manchester United than they knew any one of our players, you know, going into the stadium that day. And we are underway here at Arrowhead Stadium. It is the biggest soccer crowd ever in Kansas City history. When the whistle blew, it was game on, and, and our guys worked hard. Nice one, two. Flag stays down. Davey Arno, heavy touch. One nothing, Kansas City. That first goal was more of just excitement from the fans. You know, they, they were there, they wanted to see action. People were there to see Manchester United play, but now their home team has scored a goal. And it was just really crazy, really loud. 
And then about five or 10 minutes later, one of our defenders, Jimmy Conrad, uh, makes a tackle and, and gets a red card. So he, he gets thrown out of the game and we're down to 10 men. Berbatov, 1-1. One, one. I mean, it's one of those where like, okay, it's Manchester United, they're just gonna come back and score more goals. But we kept playing really well and the stadium switched their energy a little bit to support their home team. Three minutes later, Kai Kamara scores a huge goal for us. Kamara, 2-1. And that was when I felt the shift. The crowd went crazy. The biggest cheer that I'd ever heard at that stadium, um, including Chiefs games. So we were playing the biggest team in the world with 10 men, and we were beating them in Kansas City. At that point, you know, it was a barrage, right? There were shots coming in from everywhere, and we're making saves. Now you can see the fans are almost like working towards helping us not to allow a goal to go in. By the end of the game, there were Wizards chants and Kansas City chants everywhere. Kansas City Wizards beat Manchester United 2-1. That was the day that we really saw, if we build it, they will come. You know, we had 53,000 people or whatever the heck it was. And, and for us, it was, well, if we can bring high quality soccer, high quality entertainment, people will show up. Frankly, I didn't like the name, and I don't think anybody in our ownership group, including, you know, men, women, and children, nobody was really crazy about it. So we said, let's think about changing it. And uh, what sporting was for us was very literal. We thought, you know, if we build a, uh, a very member-based sporting club and care about, you know, connections and membership and things like that, we can, we can make something of it. So 2011 is when we switched to Sporting Kansas City, switched the color to what we patented as Sporting Blue. We had a third kit this year, an alternate kit, which we've never had before. And April 27th, we unveiled it. We sold more jerseys in halftime of that game than we did all in 2005. It turned out to be a success, but the real uh, kind of critical moment was when we signed the deal to get this stadium done, Sporting Park. When this thing opened in June of 2011, that was the change. We finally have a home, we're not going anywhere, and let's showcase the greatest game in the world in the greatest stadium we can possibly imagine. We're going in the secret way. We said that this can be a soccer town. You know, it really can be. Welcome to the greatest, greatest supporter section in all of the MLM. And for us, what's always been important is, you know, trying to have a, a real bi-directional dialogue with our fans and, and listen to what they were saying and, you know, what could make a stadium or a team more attractive to them. And it was really helpful for us in ultimately designing Sporting Park. This is the greatest owner in all of sports everywhere. Atmosphere they're able to create in the stadium on game night, it's better than it was in Europe. I believe that we will win! It's still every single game I get chills, listening to the fans sing and cheer and stand the whole game. To think where we are now, just sound-wise, is fantastic. And I think it started with that game. Just the passion in the air, and we know that soccer, that's what it is, soccer is passion. Coming up on MLS Insider. What does it take to play against Germany, against Brazil, against France or Spain? This run from Bradley, real drive from the Roma man. Now then, Fabian Johnson, can he get this right? Cross the face of goal, and yes, it's Altidore again, and the US have the lead. Still Stewart holding. Here he comes to London Donovan. The United States lead Guatemala by four goals to nil. Three wins out of three in the World Cup qualifiers in June. The US doing what they like, and Dempsey! The United States are in a kind of dreamland here. And what a moment for Jurgen Klinsmann, a victory over his home nation. It's truly an honor, and it gives me chills every time I've uh, been called up. And anytime you get to put that jersey on, it's that's the highest level that you can reach, and so it's uh, pretty special. I think all players know how important that is. There's no need for an additional kind of push. 
they are very, very proud, you know, to wear the crest and, and to represent the United States of America. It's just an amazing feeling. It's, uh, it's, it gives you so much pride. It, it's, uh, I think it's something that you've been dreaming about your whole life. Um, because before the MLS, that's all there was. It was the national team. And so the posters on your wall were U.S. national team members, not guys in the MLS. The whole country's looking, looking at you, looking at your team and, and, and the result. And um, you want to do as, as good as you can. And uh, walking out there, there's a lot of weight on your, your shoulders. The first thing I think about is, is catching that first ball and, and just getting into the game. MLS gave me an opportunity to play and, and be seen by the national team coaches on a, on a daily basis. A lot of people are fascinated about what happens uh, in the United States with MLS, you know, with soccer in general, because, you know, the, the picture was always there's basketball, football, baseball, you know, hockey, and where's soccer? <laughs> and suddenly, you know, they realize uh, over the last couple of years that so soccer is unstoppable in the United States, it's growing. I mean, if you look at, you know, how old MLS is, not even 20 years old, I mean, this is, this is fantastic what happened here the last 20 years. I sometimes tell people it's like a fairy tale. But if you have a domestic strong league like uh, 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 an MLS now growing and getting better and better every year, this is very, very important as a base for your national team. The reality will always be that there will be, you know, a good number of the best players who, who always choose at a certain point to play in Europe. And I think it has to be like that saying that there will be an important group of players who will feel that they're best served playing important roles in MLS. And so for, for the national team, this is, this, is, this is huge. Doesn't matter what league you're playing in, long as you're playing and you're playing good and consistently, you're gonna be able to help the team and you're gonna be able to put yourself in a position to be in the starting 11 come the World Cup. And I feel like coming back to MLS that I'm going to have more freedom than what I had in Europe to play more the style that I fell in love with growing up as a kid. So many veteran guys that have been there played in World Cups, and so they're literally passing their knowledge onto, onto you and onto these young guys. It takes games and trainings to gel the way we want to gel, but, but it's not always going to be perfect in the beginning. But uh, I think Jurgen and the national team staff has done a great job of, of picking the, the right personalities, uh, the right players uh, to gel. In the middle of it, and our all same interest is to make this product better, to get the game to another level, to show players, okay, what does it take to play against Germany, against Brazil, against France or Spain? You know, what do you have to do in order to beat them one day? Well, there is definitely pressure, but I think anytime there is pressure, it's, it means you're in a good spot. It means you're in an important spot, and in a spot that a ton of people would want to be in your shoes. The USA are on fire at Jacksonville. You know, and if you want to go to a World Cup and you want to compete in a World Cup, you've got to be damn hungry. Because when you meet the best in the world, you know, and they, from little on, they play every day, you know, mostly twice a day. You know, they put thousands and thousands of hours in, in that game. Yeah, you see why they are so damn good, like Spain or Brazil or Argentina. So uh, we still have a way to go. I enjoy every second of it and uh, never take it for granted. You know, it can always be uh, the last time. So you got to be focused and just be uh, in the moment and ready to, to, to perform and, and just take it in stride.
coming up on MLS Insider. Welcome to MLS Storytime Theater. Chicago, Poland. Welcome to MLS Storytime Theater. I'm the world champion, Judah Friedlander. Today's story is called The Polish Trio Meets the Three Stooges. When the Chicago Fire took the field for the first time in 1998, three Polish internationals were on the team. Peter Novak, the playmaker, Jerzy Podbrozny, the striker, and Roman Kosetsky, the comedian. The Polish trio helped to make the Fire the only expansion club to ever win the MLS Cup. But perhaps their most enduring contribution to MLS culture was in the advancement of physical comedy. Football is a sport known for its drama. Comedy, on the other hand, not appreciated by FIFA. Nah, they don't like comedy. But enter Roman Kosetsky, stage left. During a run-in with the LA Galaxy's Paul Caligiuri, it looked like high drama was about to go down at Soldier Field, and Kosetsky might drop the Polish hammer like wrestling great Ivan Putski right on Caligiuri. But instead, Kosetsky channeled Mo Howard. Instead of punching him, he gave him the knuckle-nose squeeze, and Caligiuri, trying to embellish the foul, fell to the ground. But unknowingly, what he did was an amazing piece of slapstick comedy that would have made Curly proud. To the viewer, it looked like the opposing players had rehearsed this awesome comedy sketch. And Kosetsky did not get a red card from the referee, neither did Caligiuri. The moral of the story? Make a referee laugh, save a red card. Mo Howard, comedy legend, and MLS inspiration. I'm the world champion, Judah Friedlander. Join me next time for MLS Storytime Theater. Mo Howard was born in Brooklyn. On the next MLS Insider. There was suddenly this huge explosion. At that point, I helped my brother-in-law, Donnie, up and handed him my son. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm going back to help your father. <laughs>